Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. to the session of managerial economics. I am Dr. Supriya Jain working as an assistant professor in the Institute of Business Management at GLA University, Matra. So, let us look first what we have discussed in our previous lecture and then we will start with our lecture of today. In our previous lecture, we have talked about pricing decision. Pricing decision is one of the very important decision for any firm because it generates the revenue to the firm. So, whatever the pricing method or decision are being taken up that has to be taken up very carefully, right. So, for that we have discussed various pricing methods, how firms take into account the different aspects for considering the prices of their commodity. So, here we have talked about different uh, methods, first we have talked about cost based pricing, right. As because cost is the important component, uh, we always take into account what will be the cost of production and accordingly we determine the prices. So, here we have different methods like cost plus pricing or we can use uh, you know target pricing, we can also use marginal cost pricing. So, there are different strategies which are being taken up depending upon the objective of the firm also pricing decisions are being made, right. What is the objective of the firm, whether the firm objective is to maximize the profit or they are working for the sales maximization or they are talk, talking about the growth maximization. So, what kind of objective is there, accordingly you will also determine the prices. Then there are certain pricing methods which are being opted based on the competition because we have different market structures as we have seen and different structures have different degree of competition like in monopoly we have only a single seller and the product which a monopolist sells does not have a close substitute, right. So, what pricing strategy is going to be opted by a monopolist and we uh, and there in the monopolistic competition there are different uh, substitutes which are available for the product. So, they need to opt another pricing policy, ok. So, how much degree of competition is involved in the market will also affect the pricing policy decision. Thereafter, we have talked about the uh, product life cycle stage, yes. Definitely, the product has a different stages, right. So, during the lifestyle, life uh, stages of the product, what are the different methods which can be opted by the firm? Because when the product is new to the market, when people are not aware of it, then definitely uh, sometimes the firms enter with the penetration pricing policy where uh, they want to enter initially into the market, keeping their prices low. And some of the firms uh, also come up with the price skimming if they are coming with the, some kind of innovative product like we have discussed the example of mobile phone, right, when new mobile phone was there with the camera, with the another features which was not there earlier. So, this is the pricing strategy which has been taken up to attract those customers who are ready to pay more prices and uh, ready to buy the customer to have a social status in the uh, society, right. So, uh, product at their different stages uh, are, are uh, being followed with the different pricing methods. Then we have cyclical pricing also because in business we have different cycles and what kind of uh, you know expansion and recession phases which are taking place in the economy, right. And during those effect what should be the pricing decision or what change in the prices should firms take uh, that we have discussed here. We can choose rigid pricing policy also some of the firms follow the flexible pricing policy depending upon the nature of the commodity. Then we have multi product pricing policy, the companies or the uh, firms which are producing multiple product. So, they need to understand the interdependence of demand, interdependence of supply or maybe the input output relationship, right, before they go ahead with the pricing of their commodity. Then we have retail pricing as because we know retail, uh, uh, retailer is a one who is in direct touch with the customer and who makes the product available to the customer from the wholesaler, right. So, what different pricing, uh, pricing methods can be followed up by the retailers so as they would be able to increase their demand. Then there are administered prices uh, which are being administered by the government. We have export pricing, the firms dealing into international market or th those who are engaged in the import and exports of the goods. Then, then what are the considerations they need to take care of because here 
uh, you are talking about sending your product to the another country. So, different dimensions and different aspects are taken into account before we uh, keep the pricing of the commodity when we are exporting it. And then lastly, we have talked about international price discrimination, uh, how differently we can charge the prices for the same commodity in different market depending upon the requirement, depending upon the elasticities in the market, right. And then there are uh, some kind of uh, pricing policies which are being taken up by the firm which are called as dumping where uh, you know the firm try to export their product in bulk at a lower prices. So, these were the topics which were covered in our previous lecture and now we are going to talk about this part of lecture where we are going to study about macroeconomics, right. Till now we have seen the problems from the individual's perspective, right and we have talked about demand, we have talked about supply of an individual commodity, how consumer behave in the market. We have seen the consumer equilibrium curve where the producer is going to reach out at equilibrium. We have also talked about market structures where individual firms decision making were discussed regarding the price and output decision, right? And how we are going to consider the prices for an individual commodity. So, this is all we have seen from the individual perspective because managerial economics or managerial economics is concerned more with the individual problem. But like I said it earlier, uh, being micro in nature, it is very important for us to know what is happening around in the economy, right? Because whatever the changes are taking place at, uh, you know, economy level, all those changes are going to very much affect our individual concerns, right? Individual working as because we are a part of society, we are not working in the isolation. So, it is again very important for us to know about those variables. So, let us start with our discussion with uh, the ma mic uh, macroeconomics and by the end of this session, you will be uh, getting these things to understand where you will be able to know the uh, circular flow of economic activities and income, right. And then you will be introduced with the concept of aggregates, right, aggregates mean total. Uh, you will get to know about the difference between stock and flow and what goods are being called as final goods. Uh, here you will be able to know the concept of national income like GDP, GNP, NNP and you will be able to discuss and analyze the different methods of measuring national income, right. What is national income and how do we measure national income that you will understand and you will also understand the advantages of national income calculation uh, in global perspective, right. Why are we calculating it and what are the problems which we face with the calculation of national income. So, in this particular lecture, you will get to know about the macroeconomic variables and we will see the economy with the uh, bigger view, right. So, uh, we begin with the macroeconomics first, right. Macroeconomics is that part of economics where we are going to talk about aggregates, right. Here we are going to discuss about the national income of the economy, not the individual income of a person, not an individual demand or supply by a single producer, okay. So, here you are going to discuss the things as a whole, economy as a whole you are going to study. So, here we have the very first definition given by, uh, you know, Culberston. Uh, he defines that macroeconomic theory is the theory of income, employment, prices and money. Right. So, these are the important variables which we take into account for the study of macroeconomics and in the word of Samuelson, macroeconomics is the study of the behavior of economy as a whole. Whereas, if you recall back, we have discussed that microeconomic was the study of individual's behavior, how consumer make choices, right, how consumers behave. Whereas, in macroeconomics, we talk about the economy as a whole, we study the behavior of the people of a country, how they are going to behave, right. It examine the overall level of, uh, you know, nation's output, what production has been taken place, how much employment is being generated, prices, general prices of the commodities and we talk, we do talk about foreign trades. So, it is that part of economy which deals with the aggregate, which deals with the economy as a whole, right. Now, let us uh, understand before we talk about national income, it is very important for us to know how economy performs, right. And to understand this economic performance measure, we have to talk about the circular flow of economic activities and income. And this we will be discussing in two parts, where we are going to talk about two sector economy and four sector economy, okay. So, what is meant by this two sector economy and four sector economy? 
Before that, let us have a look on circular flow because we are going to talk about the circular flow of economic activities and income. How the flow of economic activities and income takes place between these sectors, right? So, initially we will start with two sector and then we will incorporate it into four sector. The flow of money income or the flow of goods, right? Money income is the income flow and the flow of goods and services across the different sectors of the economy in a circular form is being considered as in circular flow, right? It is the flow of activities of production, income and expenditure involving different sectors of the economy and these sectors are named as household sector, producer sector, government sector and the rest of the world where you can call it as an foreign nation, right? Or the external sector uh, outside the world, right? So, these are the four sectors which, uh, have, which are having this circular flow of economic activities and income and what kind of interaction being taken place, okay? So, that is all we are going to cover here and to understand this flow we have three phases and uh, starting with the production phase because production uh, initially started and this production gives income to the people whatever the uh, you know factors we are going to use for the production purpose they will generate income and this generation of income will lead to the phase of expenditure right whatever you will be doing whatever the expenditure you will be doing that you will be doing with the income and again this expenditure will lead further to the phase of production because that demands more of goods and services and for the demand for, for the accomplishment of this demand of goods and services we get into this phase of production. So, it is like you can see the interconnection between the phase of production give rises to the phase of income generation and then the income generation leads to the phase of expenditure and then further this phase of expenditure goes back to the phase of production, right? So, this circular flow of economic activities and income are going to be discussed in this heading, right? And like I said, these are the four decision makers of our uh, economy. At the one hand, we have households, we have firm, then we have government and we do have foreign sector because of the globalization, we are continuously interacting with the other economies also, right? So, here we are having the circular flow of income and activities in the two sector model. So, let us have a look how these two sectors are interacting. This is like one sector which we are calling it as an household sector and household sector includes people like you and me where we are making joint decisions regarding uh, the purchase of goods and services and these are the firms, right? These are the people who are into the production of goods and services. Now, have a look how these two sectors are interacting with each other. These are the set of people who want to have factors of production for the production of goods and services because they are the producers and for the production of goods and services they require factors of production. So, from where are they going to get these factors of production? We household people are going to provide them factors of production because we are the people who want to purchase goods and services so as we would be able to satisfy our needs and wants and for those purchase of goods and services we need income. So, how are we going to generate that income? So, based on these questions, we understand this flow of, uh, you know, economic uh, income as well as economic activities and income between the sectors. So, you can see the factor services are moving from households toward the firm. So, these are the factor services which we provide to the firms for the production of goods and services in the form of land, labor, capital, entrepreneur, right? And whatever the services are being provided to the firms, on behalf of that, they are receiving the pack, uh, payment of factor income, right? And this income is in the form of if we have provided the land, we will receive rent on it. We are giving capital to them. We receive interest on it. If you are providing entrepreneur, we are getting profit to it. So, the services which we are providing to the household, uh, to the firms, they are providing uh, the payment for those services, right? That is called as factor income. Now, with that income, what we are going to do? We are going to buy goods and services. So, as you can see, this product market is coming from uh, this uh, industry to the household and for all those services which we are taking up, we are going to make the payment to the firm. So, this is how uh, the things are moving from one sector to the another. Only the form has been changed and this makes the circular flow, right? In, in one way, you are go giving them and then they are returning back to you in the another form and then you are buying goods and services from them by making the payments which is called as consumption expenditure. So, here we have two types of flow which we can see here, one is called as money flow and the other one is called as real flow, right? 
So, money flow is in the form of money when you were receiving uh, the payment for the factor services you are providing and at the time when you were making payment of goods and services uh, which you are purchasing from the firms, right. Whereas, real flow is in the physical form where you are, po you are providing the factor services to the firms and uh, you were getting these goods and services in return for the payment which you are making. So, here we have two types of flows which are taking place. One is called as money flow, it is in a monetary term, whereas real flow includes the flow of goods and services, right. So, I hope this interaction between two sectors is clear and this is the simplest form where we are understanding. Now, before we move ahead, I would like to make you understand uh, there is an involvement of another sector which is called as financial market, though we are going to cover it in the four sector model also, but just to give you a basic understanding of this sector, what happens, whatever the income we are, uh, you know, getting from this, uh, these firms in the form of factor income and being a rational person, we usually do not spend the entire income on the consumption of goods and services, rather we used to save some money for the future consideration, right. Because being rational, uh, the customer does not, uh, you know, spend their entire income, right. They always keep into account the future requirements and as because future is uncertain, it is full of risk. So, it is always believed that they, they usually keep, uh, take some out money, uh, take some money out of it and they keep these money in the financial sector, right. So, the money which has been taken out by the household people usually been called as leakages, right. And when they, they take out this money from this circular flow, what are they going to do with this money? They are going to save it in the financial market, what we usually do. We save our money in the financial market, we keep it in our bank accounts or we can uh, buy some shares, we can buy some bonds, right. So, these kind of investments, policies which we used to buy, so these kind of uh, things we usually do with our savings, right. And then what will, uh, what financial market is going to do with that money? Are they going to keep this money with themselves? No, definitely not, right. They are further going to invest this money uh, into the firms, right. So, basically what we are saying, we can see that the savings are coming from the households and then we are in the uh, financial markets are going to make the investments in the firms of that money, so that they can also multiply their money and can get uh, the good interest which they can also give to the uh, households people on their saving. So, this is how this circular flow takes place, right. So, moving ahead, uh, we can also have a difference between the leakages and the injection. Basically, the money which we have taken out, let me go back to make you understand about these leakages and injections, what are we calling it as an uh, leakage and what term is being considered as an injection. The money which we are taking out from the circular flow is being termed as a leakage, right. So, the uh, you know the income which we are uh, getting from the uh, firms, right and the money which we are taking out from this flow, the savings constitutes the part of leakages and this investment is basically the injection, right. The money which we have taken out earlier, now we are injecting again into this flow by the way of investments. So, that is being called as injection, right. So, to have a clear understanding of difference between the leakages and the injections, initially we are saying the flow variable that have a negative impact on the process of production. Since you are taking out this money from the milo, definitely if the money will be lesser by this amount, definitely the production of uh, the goods will be lesser by this amount. So, this creates a negative impact whereas injection will create a positive impact because now you are again injecting this money into the flow where the production of goods and services will increase by this amount. So, this creates a positive impact whereas leakages will create a negative impact. Secondly, we are saying these are the withdrawals from the circular flow like I said, uh, the money which we take out from the circular flow will constitute a part of leakage whereas these are the additions, this is the injection investment you are making again to that flow. So, these are the additions of uh, income to the circular flow and if you look at the effect of these leakages on the economy, first of all we are saying uh, there will be a reduction in the flow of income and production, right, because uh, this will reduce the size of production and when the production will be low, generation of income will be lesser and this will also reduce the demand for goods and services because when income will be lesser, definitely the demand for goods and services will also reduce, whereas opposite to it, we have injection 
which will add to the production capacity and will also help people to have more employment and this more income will help in the generation of demand of goods and services. And here we have some examples like for leakages, you have examples like savings, the taxation which we are making as well as the import, right? Whatever we import from the other country, so import constitute a part of leakage because this is the money, this is uh, those goods for which we have to make the payment and the income is going from our country to the another company, uh, another country, right? Whereas investments are the part of injections, here you are investing it again, exports which you are making, right? The exports which we do, uh, for that we receive the money, right? We receive the payments on the uh, export. So that is going to add to our country uh, flow of income. So that is why they have been considered as an injection. Consumption expenditure is also uh, a part of injection because this is the way you are injecting this money again, uh, uh, again to the circular flow, right? So this is how we understand the difference between the leakages and the injection. Now we have this four sector economy model, right? So earlier two interactions are already clear to us where we have uh, seen the interaction between the households and the firm and I have also made you understand the interaction of financial market, how the financial market plays the role in the two sector as well as in the four sector economy. Now to look at the bigger picture as we all know governments play a very important role in economic consideration. So it is, uh, you know, rather impossible to have this picture where we have only two sectors. So government is always there and as we are also interacting with the foreign nation, right, we are also, uh, you know, exporting and importing goods from the other countries uh, regularly. So we do have an interaction with the foreign nation. So these two uh, sectors we have included in the four sector economy and this give you a complete idea of interaction taking place between the two uh, four sector economy, right? So let us look the interaction of households with the government, right? As you all know, many of us are also uh, the government employees, we are working in the government organization. So the payment uh, which is being made to us in the form of salary is the flow coming from the government, right? And whatever the income we are earning either from the firms or through the government, we need to pay the taxes to the government. Okay, so this is again an inflow and outflow uh, taking place from the government to the household. Same case if you talk about firms, right? Government people are providing remittance on purchases. These, they are providing subsidies to the firm for the growth and development of the firm and growth and development of the economy. So the subsidies which are being provided by the government to the firm will comes from government to the firm and again, whatever the goods and services they are producing, they need to pay taxes to the government for the same, right? Then if you look at the interaction of households and firm, uh, then we at the individual level also we are interacting with the foreign nation. So here we are calling it in a broad category which is called as import and export, right? If we are sending something uh, to the other country then that constitute is part of export and if we are getting something from the other nation, we constitute as a part of import, right? Getting something from the foreign nation is import and sending something is the export, right? In the same way, firms are also interacting by the way of import and export with the foreign nation, right? Government is also having the interaction with the financial market, right? Like uh, household peoples are keeping their savings in the financial market. Uh, we can also buy government bonds, we can also buy government shares, right? And financial markets also make their investments in the government organization as well as in the private organization as well as they can also invest in the foreign nation. Right, other country people are also making investments in our country. We have FDIs and FIIs. FDIs are your foreign direct investment and we have foreign institutional investors, right? So these kind of interaction takes place, right? So this is uh, the four sector economy model which gives you a complete picture of your understanding how this circular flow of economic activities take place and what kind of interaction has been taking place between these sector, right? So a uh, role of financial market I believe is clear to every one of you uh, and then let, let proceed further where we are going to talk about macroeconomic variables now, right? The circular flow of economic activity has given us the understanding of economic activities and income among the various sectors, right? The broader categories of sectors we are having. Now if you have to understand the national income, how do we calculate it and what are the things which we are going to take into account for the national income understanding. 
for that it becomes important for us to know about these macroeconomic variables because these variable will make your study easier and simpler uh, with the terminology which we are going to study here. So, one is your aggregate demand and aggregate supply, aggregate demand is basically the total demand by all the consumer in an economy, right? whereas aggregate supply constitute the total supply by all the producers in an economy. right? And when we talk about demand, demand means demand for all type of goods, whether they are capital goods or the consumer goods. Same, same is the way uh, we are calling it as a supply, supply of capital goods or supply of consumer goods. So, here we are uh, denoting uh, AD for the aggregate demand, C for the consumer goods and I for the capital goods. So, all the consumer goods demanded by uh, the residents of in the economy, right? Like all the people in the economy as well as the demand for capital goods will constitute a part of aggregate demand. Same way, uh, the supply of consumer goods by all the producer and the supply of capital goods by all the suppliers uh, will create an aggregate demand. right? So, this is how we calculate aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Next is stocks and flow. right? Uh, what is being called as a stock and what is being calculated as flow? See, stock is something which is accumulated over a period of time. right? Uh, when, when things are being accumulated over a period of time and you are calculating it, then we call it as a stock. Flow is something which is, uh, you know, inflow and outflow. Okay? If, if something is increasing your stock is the inflow, if something is reducing the stock that is outflow. A very simple examples are written here to make this concept more clear to everyone. See, inventory is the stock, the inventory, the stock of inventory I am having in my organization constitute a part of stock. But whatever the incoming goods we are adding to that stock will be inflow and if we are uh, sending the goods out of that inventory stock we are having that is the outflow. right? Bank balance in my account, right? at present uh, whatever the balance I am having in my account is a part of stock, right? the amount which has been accumulated over a period of time. But if I am uh, you know, depositing something to it, if I am adding something to it that will constitute a part of flow, that is inflow. And if I am taking out something from it that constitute a part of withdrawal, that is outflow, right? So this is how we differentiate between the concept of uh, you know stock and flow, and it is very important to understand between the difference among stock and flow because there are different calculations we are going to make, right? To understand how we are going to measure the wealth of, uh, wealth of the economy, that is with the help of stock and flow. Another example can be population in the country over a period of time is a stock, whereas the people who are taking birth and immigrating coming from the other country would constitute a part of inflow and the deaths and the immigration will be outflow. right? Then let us look at the difference between intermediate goods and final good. This is very important for the understanding because uh, for the understanding of national income, especially for the calculation of national income rather I should say we take into account the value of final goods. right? So, how are we differentiating these intermediate goods with the final good? Intermediate goods are those goods which are going to be, uh, you know, which are used for further processing. right? Intermediate goods are those goods which are used for further processing, whereas final goods are those goods which are, uh, which are used directly, right? which are not used for the further processing. So, intermediate goods are those items which are purchased by the goods for using them in the production of some other goods of utility, right? you are using them for further uh, purpose of utility or the you produce them another good for, uh, for those from those goods would be considered as an intermediate good and whereas final goods are being demanded final by a final consum uh, consumer for using these goods as they are. right? You are not going to use them further for the creation of utility. Now, this becomes difficult for some time. Uh, for the calculation of national income, which good should be considered as a final good or which should be used as a intermediate good, because that usually depend upon the usage. Suppose if I am buying a personal computer for myself, right? if I am buying a laptop for myself, then this particular good would be considered as a final good, because I am using it for my personal use. But if the same personal computer is being purchased by some computer institution, right? 
So, for them it would be considered as an intermediate good because they are going to use it as a resource right, which is going to help them to provide the knowledge to their students right. So, th there is a difference for what purpose you are buying it right, if you are using it for your own purpose then we consider that product to be an final good, whereas if it is used for some uh, producing some other goods and services then it has been considered as an intermediate good. So, this understanding has to be done very carefully because for the calculation of national income we take into account the value of final goods and services. Then the another important variable is the employment right, because macroeconomic talks about the employment in the economy and employment is a condition where a person is ready to work for uh, some other person for some specified uh, you know period and on specified conditions. Now, uh, usually we understand this employment rate into the terms of unemployment and unemployed is a person is a person who is seeking for a job, but is not able to uh, get a job right. So, if, if economies fail to provide them the job then we consider those people as an unemployed people which is again not a good indicator of an economy, because if the economy is not capable of providing employment to their people that means economy is not able to generate that much of economic activity right. So, lower will be the unemployment rate the better will be for the economy right. So, this is again important for the understanding of the growth of the economy right, uh, whether the company has full employment or not. Then we have government expenditure and revenue, uh, government has uh, different consideration we know, uh, the income uh, which the government is generating the source of revenue of for the government is basically the taxation right, the major part of the revenue generated for the government is by the way of taxation. So, we are here going to focus upon the expenditure part, revenue is known to every one of you. But how we are differentiating between the government revenue here for the calculation of national income, government make expenditure on different commodities and for different purposes. So, if you talk about the expenditure of government on the total expen current expenditure right, uh, it is been calculated for the calculation of national income, the expenditure which has been done for the economic development uh, of the economy right, that expenditure of government has been considered. Uh, to be a part of national income, whereas there are certain expenditure made by the government for the welfare of the society right. Like for example, if you are making payment to the old people, the retirement, the pensions which are given to the old people, uh, if you are providing uh, you know payments to the unemployed people or the handicapped people or to the needy families right. So, payment made in this form is not going to be considered or will not be taken into account for the calculation of national income because this kind of income is usually been called as transfer uh, pricing right. These, this is the transfer payment not pricing, this is the transfer payment which is been made by the government to that section of society there they, where they want to generate welfare right. So, this has to be again uh, taken care of whenever we are calculating national income, we are only going to calculate that expenditure of government. Uh, in the national income which has been made on the uh, you know expenditure made by the government on national defense, road building, maintenance, railways, national health, freedom, uh, free education, salary of government employees. So, all such expenditures are being taken up, whereas the payment made in the form of transfer earning they are not being considered. Now, let us have a look of national income right. We have talked enough of what is macroeconomics, we have also seen the interaction of economic activities between two sectors and four sectors and so far we have also talked about the macroeconomic variables right. Now, let us talk about what is national income and what are the different ways of calculating this national income. So, if you look at the definition first given by Somilson, he defines that national income or a product is the final figure you arrive at when you apply the measuring rod of money to the divers of apples, oranges, battleship and machine that any society produces with land, labor and capital resources. So, simply if we understand the meaning of this definition, we say that national income is the measurement of all the goods and services which are produced in an economy during an accounting year by all the factors of production 
So, that is basically been considered to be as a national income and as it is difficult for us to add all these goods and services together. So, what do we do? We, uh, we uh, you know calculate the money value of this these goods and services. So, that is what is written here when you apply uh, the final figure, when you uh, calculate the final figure you apply the measuring rod of money. This is again important because the only way of adding these goods and services is to convert it into monetary value, right. Another definition is given by National Income Committee of India 1951. They define that national income estimates measure the volume of commodities and services turned out during a given period counted without duplication, right. So, without duplication here we are using because whatever the figure we have around, arrived at we need to take into account the final uh, goods and services, the value of final goods and services. But if you have calculated the value of intermediate goods also, then the figure which you will be getting would be a duplicated figure, right. So, if you want to have a right figure of national income, you should be counting it without duplication, where you have only taken into account the goods and services which are in their final form, right. So, again in general way we can say that national income is defined as the money value of all the final goods and services produced in an economy during an accounting period of time and that usually is one year, right. After every year we calculate this national income. National income is basically the one which gives us the measure of economic performance of the economy as a whole, right. Why do we calculate it basically? The simple reason you can say that it gives you an indication of economic activities taking place in the economy, right. How much economic activity you are able to generate, that idea you will be able to get with the calculation of national income. And it also uh, is a set of rules and definition for measuring economic activities in the economy, right. Economic performance and economic activities you can easily measure with the calculation of national income. Now, moving further, we have these measures of calculating national income, right, uh, what are the criteria which are being taken into consideration for the calculation of national income. So, these are four measures, we have GDP, GNP, NDP and NNP. Now, what is GDP? GDP, uh, it is usually been called as gross domestic product, right. Gross domestic product is uh, basically the money value of final goods and services produced within the domestic territory, okay. The important thing which you have to remember here is we are taking only the final value of those goods and services which are being produced within the domestic territory of an economy during an accounting year. So, here we are only measuring the money value of those goods which are being produced within the domestic territory. Right. Now, in this GDP what do we do is, we include the income from export and payment made or import, okay. We also take into account the difference between import and export. However, this GDP data does not include the earning of national working abroad and also the foreign national working in our country, right. The people, the resident of India, right, who are residing out of India and they are uh, doing their jobs there, so whatever the payment they are taking right, we do not add to this GDP, that income we are not going to add and we are also not, uh, you know, deducting the payments which we are making to the foreign nationals working in our country. So, GDP is basically the final value of all those goods and services which are being produced within the domestic territory of an economy during an accounting year, that is GDP and it also includes the data of import and export made in the economy, right. So, the output produced by all these individual and businesses, however, not included in the GDP, uh, the people who are working outside the India, that actually constitute the part of GNP. Now, if you talk about GNP, what GNP is? GNP is the aggregate final output of citizens and business of an economy in an year, right. Within a year, whosoever is the citizen of the economy right, the final output of the citizens and the businesses of the economy will constitute the part of GNP. And there is a simple way of calculating GDP, what we actually do is, 
when we reach to the figure of GDP, once we calculated the domestic production or, or the goods and services which are produced within the domestic territory, okay, what we do here is we use to add NFIA to it. So, GD, GNP we will be able to receive when we add NFIA to GDP and what is this NFIA? NFIA is net factor income from abroad, right. It is the difference between the income received by the uh, you know national people who are working outside and the payments which we are making to the foreign nationals working in our country, right. And the difference has been called as NFIA. So, when we add this figure of NFIA to GDP, we will get the figure of GNP. But here one thing you need to take into consideration is uh, you know GNP can be less than GDP and that depends upon the figure of NFIA. If your payments are more, right, suppose if you are making more payments to the foreign nationals working in your country and your receivings, your incomes are lesser to it, then your NFIA will be uh, negative, right, it will, you, the figures which you will get in minus, right. So, in that case your gross national product will be lesser than GDP. But of course, if NFIA is positive where your earnings are more than the payments which you are making to the foreign national, then uh, you will be able to get uh, GNP more than GDP, right. So, these are the gross value first of all you need to understand that and then when you want to get the net values, right, when you want to arrive to the net values of NDP and NNP from GDP and GNP, the simple way we do it by deducting the depreciation, okay. Once we deduct the depreciation from the gross value, the figures which we arrive would be considered to be our net values, okay. So, when we deduct depreciation from GDP, we receive NDP. When we deduct depreciation from GNP, then we get NNP. The another way of calculating NNP is, that, uh, you know, deducting depreciation from it and adding NFIA to it, right. The previous uh, formula which we have seen for the calculation of GNP, right. So, you can add uh, NFIA to GDP and you can deduct the depreciation, the figure you will be uh, getting would be known as net national product, okay, that is called as NNP. And then we have NNP uh, or GNP at market price and at factor cost and that difference we are going to cover in further in this lecture as well. Factor cost is basically the cost of production, right. If you are calculating it on the cost on which you are producing it, then we calculate it at factor cost and when we calculate it on the price at which we are selling it in the market that is called as market price, okay. And as because there is a difference between the factor cost and the market price, okay. So, that depends what, what uh, figure we are calculating, are we calculating the national income at factor cost or we are calculating the national income at market price because both are giving us the money value of those goods and services which are produced in an economy during a financial year, right. Now, what is meant by per capita income? What is per capita income? Per capita income is an income per head, right. What is an average person earning in an economy? So, again there is a very simple formula, this is income per head. Right. What we do is we calculate the national income, the total income of the people in the country and then we divide it with the total population, okay. So, the figure which you are going to get is the figure of per capita income, right. This is the indicator of, uh, you know, standard of people in the economy, right. This indicates like what is the income per head of a country, though this is not a, you know, actual income of the people in the country because of the difference in the distribution of income in the different sectors, right. But yes, definitely this per capita income will help you to understand uh, the standard of, uh, you know, living of the people in the economy and their income per head, okay. For that we calculate this per capita income. Then we have personal disposable income. Now, what is disposable income? If you deduct the, uh, you know, taxes from your income, whatever the income you are earning as we have seen it earlier in the circular flow, right, whatever the earning we are getting, we need to pay taxes to the government, okay. So, after deducting this taxes from the uh, income which we are earning would be called as personal disposable income. Now, this is the income which you can dispose of, right, in the manner you want to disco uh, dispose of or whatever the goods and services you want to purchase from this right, you can get it by deducting the taxes from it, okay. So, personal income is the total income received by the individual of the country from all sources which is before tax and whereas, 
पर्सनल डिस्पोजेबल इनकम इज द इनकम विच कैन बी स्पेंड ऑन द कंजम्पन बाई इंडिविजुअल्स एंड फैमिलीज बिकॉज हेयर यू हैव फुलफिल योर पेमेंट ऑफ टैक्स लाइबिलिटी राइट सो नाउ एज वी हैव अंडरस्टूड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ नेशनल इनकम एंड वी हैव ऑल्सो टॉक्ड अबाउट इट्स मेजर जी डी पी जी एन पी एन जी पी एंड एन एन पी एंड वी हैव ऑल्सो टॉक्ड अबाउट पर कैपिटल इनकम एंड पर्सनल डिस्पोजेबल इनकम नाउ लेट एस गो टू दी नेक्स्ट हेडिंग वेयर वी आर गोइंग टू लुक एट दी मेथड्स how do we measure this national income right what are the different methods which are available to us through which we can calculate this national income so uh, basically this national income can be calculated by three different ways right and we have three different uh, ways of calculating it the first method is called as product method which is also called as output method then we have income method and we do have expenditure method this is basically called as gnp gni and GNE, gross national product, gross national income. Sorry, GNI, and this is GNE. That is gross national expenditure, right? So whatever the method we are using, we can calculate it either by product method because whatever the production has been made in the economy, if we are calculating it, we would be able to find out the uh, you know national income, and and you can also say that. how whatever the production has been taken place accordingly the income generation has been done in the economy if you remember the phases of uh, you know economic uh, activities we have talked about this production is the uh, very first phase right where we start with the production and with this production income generation takes place and with this income only people are able to make their expenditure so whatever the way we are using for the calculation of national income ideally the figures we are going to arrive at the end should remain same right ideally it should be equal gdp should be equals to gne uh, gni and it should be equals to gne right uh, it should be equal but they are not in real sense because uh, every method have their own advantages as well as disadvantages so ideally we are not getting the same figure but we should be uh, whatever the way we are using for the calculation of national income uh, we should be getting a similar figure because uh, we can calculate it either by product method by looking at whatever the production has been taken place in the economy or whatever the income has been generated to the people or what expenditure they have made in the economy right so first we are going to talk about the product method this is uh, the very first method you can say and this is the method which has been called as industry by origin right because industries are been originated for the production purpose right so the product method basically what do they add up the market value of final goods and services produced by uh, the people or by all the firms in the country across all industries right so first what we do is we calculate this uh, national income by the product method and for the calculation we uh, take up the money value of all the final goods and services which are been produced in the economy right so this these are the steps basically right for your better understanding how do we calculate national income using these steps we calculate national income by the product method firstly we need to divide our industry right we need to divide our industry based on the sectors we have primary sector secondary sector and we have tertiary sector okay so all these industries are been divided into different sectors and then we uh, you know calculate the physical unit of output okay whatever the production has been taken up in the physical form we interpret it money value right because it is not possible for us to add two commodities together other than its money value so we calculate the money value of those goods and services thus the value we have obtained we are going to add it up so from all the different sectors first we have divided the economy on the basis of different sectors different industries and then we have seen whatever the output is been produced by all of them we calculated the money value of all those goods and services then we added them up together and what do we do then we deduct the taxes from those uh, that amount okay we deduct the uh, taxes because these taxes are been made to the payment and we add the subsidies given by the government okay so this will give you the figure of either gdp or gnp that depends upon the data which you have taken if you have only taken the production made by the firm within the domestic territory then that will be a figure of gdp but if you have also taken up nfia right uh, the production made by the people outside the domestic territory as well 
right. So, then you will get the figure of GNP and after deducting the depreciation from GNP or GDP, you will receive the figure of NNP that is the NAT national uh, product, ok. So, word of caution has to be repeated here is the thing which you have to take care of while calculating the national income by the product method that we only take the value of final goods and services, right. So, this is one thing which you need to remember, we only take the value of final goods and services produced in an economy during an accounting year, right. Okay, looking uh, this way, we can calculate product method, we can calculate the income by product method in two different ways. We can use the final product method also or we can use the value added method. See, the final product method is a final way of calculating national income and you look at the final prices, right. You look at the final prices at which the product is being sold. That means, you are calculating the national income by product method. Here, you will take the market price of the product, the prices which I was telling you initially, uh, GDP at market price or uh, you know ND, NNP at market price or NNP at factor price that is FC, factor cost, ok. Whereas, in value added method, you take up the initial value of the product and then you add up the different values which are being added at different stages. because. Uh, product reaches from producer to the wholesaler, then it reaches from wholesaler to the retailer and then finally, it reaches to the customer. So, every channel will add their value uh, to know to, to do that product. So, finally, at what price it will reach to the consumer? If you directly take that price, then we are calculating the national income by the final product method, but if you are adding the values, ok, what different values are being added at different stages? So, this is the another way of calculating it, you can also go ahead with this method and the answer which you will be going to get will be same because here your way of calculating is different, but you are actually going to reach at the same figure, ok. So, these are the different ways where you can calculate the national income by the product method. Now, let us look at the limitation part, right, what are the limitations of product method? So, here we have three problem, the first is of double counting problem, yes, this is very much uh, possible when we calculate the national income because it has been asked that we are supposed to take only the figure of, uh, you know, final goods and services, right. To avoid the duplicacy in the uh, figure, we, uh, we do not take into account the value of intermediate goods, but it becomes very difficult for the understanding of the people that which product is being used as an intermediary product or which is being used as an final product, right. So, this problem will always be there. Then, not applicable to territory sector because in case of services, it becomes very difficult to calculate uh, the input output relationship. So, this is not very much applicable to the territory sector and here exclusion of non-marketed product. Basically, in our economy, there are the production of various goods and services takes place, but there are certain goods which never reach to the market. So, we never able to calculate their money value or monetary value, like if I am uh, painting something out of my, you know, habit or my interest. So, production of that activity has taken place, but because I am doing it for my own purpose, I am not doing it for uh, selling purpose, then definitely it will not reach to the market. So, that amount will not be added to the calculation of national income. So, here we have limitations of product method. The another way of calculating national income is the income method. Like I said, whatever the income is being generated in the economy, if you are taking into account the total income of the people earned by people from different sources. So, if you are calculating it by the, that way, we can also calculate national income. So, let us look at the steps which we need to follow, right. Like we have uh, the steps to be followed for the calculation of national income via product method. Same way for the calculation of national income by uh, income method, what we need to do is here we are going to divide the economy on the basis of income groups, right. Like what total income is being earned in the form of wages, in the form of salary earners, rent earners, profit earners and so on, right. Now, for income from each of these uh, group uh, is being calculated and income of these group are being added together including the income of the people working abroad as well as undistributed profit of the firm, right. So, here the income earned by the foreign foreigners and transfer payment made in the year are being subtracted, ok. So, whatever the payments you are making to the foreign national working in your country and the payment made by the government in the form of transfer pricing, if you recall back I have told you 
current expenditure of government is only taken in the calculation of national income, but if any income is being received in the form of transfer, uh, payment is not going to be added, right. So, the national income at factor cost you will be able to calculate when you include rent, interest, profit and other incomes where you are deducting income from abroad by your people and the payments which you are making to the foreigner, the difference which is called as NFIA as well as you deduct the amount of transfer payment from it would be called as national income by income method, right. So, these are some steps which we follow for the calculation of national income by income method. Then this method do have certain limitation as well that there is an exclusion of non-monetary income, right. Non-monetary income like whatever uh, you know there are certain services which you are rendering out of love and you know affection, okay. If, if a husband is taking help of uh, his wife in his business, right and not paying any salary to her, right. So, this is basically where we are not, she is not getting any income and if she is not receiving any income then this amount will not be added to the national income, right. And we have uh, certain non-marketed services also. Right, there are certain services which are being rendered out of love and affection, okay, the services of the housewife, okay, because she is, whatever she is doing, she is uh, doing out of love and affection. So, services which are being offered or rendered without the involvement of income or the payment made to them uh, are not being added to the calculation of national income. So, again we have the limitation with this income method. Moving ahead, we have expenditure method as well, right whatever is being produced and whatever is being uh, earned, right, we are going to make the expenditure of the same, right. So, if we look at the total expenditure in the economy, right, and we calculate the figures of this total expenditure, then also we can calculate the national income. So, what all we basically include uh, in the calculation of uh, national income for by the expenditure method, here we have four categories. First, we look at the expenditure made on the consumption, right, because this is the largest expenditure which is made by the people in the economy. So, whatever is being spent on the consumption of goods and services that if we include, then secondly, if we are not spending it on the consumption, we make the investments, right. Investment can be done in the different forms. So, if we look at the total uh, expenditure made on the investment and then we also take care of expenditure by the government, right, the expenditure made by the government uh, or the current expenditure, uh, we include the uh, expenditure made by the government in the calculation of national income other than the transfer payment that expenditure we take here and then we also take into account net export which is the difference between the import and export. So, the expenditure made into four the in, in, in all of these four categories, right, if we calculate them all, if we sum up them all together then we can also calculate national income by expenditure method, right. So, these are the three methods which we have taken up and there are some precautions which we need to take while calculating the national income by expenditure method like we only take final expenditure, okay, uh, made within the uh, economy in the current year itself. Expenditure on the second hand goods are not being taken into consideration, right. If I am purchasing some second hand product in that particular year is not being taken into account. Expenditure on shares and bonds, right. Uh, like on the, on the paper uh, work which we are going to make or, or, or expenditure on share on bonds is also been taken care of and uh, not taken into account and expenditure on transfer payment by the government and this we already know the expenditure which is made by the government in the form of transfer payment is not been included because this has been done for the social welfare of the economy, right. Then let us look at the uses of national income. National income is used for the economic planning. It is the indicator of economic growth, it helps in the comparison of the economic growth of the different countries, it also helps you in determining the regional disparities and it is a measurement of economic welfare and that is why every economy calculate the national income. And lastly, let us look at the difficulties in the measurement of national income. Overall difficulty if we talk about what problems do we face whenever we calculate national income, the first is the non-monetized transaction. Right, it is. It becomes very difficult for us to calculate those transactions which are not being done in a monetary form. Okay, so like we have seen the problem we have faced in the income method. There are non-monetized, uh, non-monetized transactions. Right, there uh, people are not getting any in payments for the services which they are rendering. 
right and, and, the, and the goods which are being produced are not being sold in the market. So, these non monetized transactions are not being added to the calculation of national income. Then in our economy, we have a large uh, portion of unorganized sector, right? the sectors which cannot be taken into account uh, by either of the three methods like if there is a roadside tea shop right? And, and if the expenditure you are making on that particular shop, how are you going to calculate it? Because these people are not paying any taxes, right? the, the payments which we are making to our domestic helpers. right? So, it is very difficult to calculate their income and you know to calculate it in the national income. Then if people are having multiple source of income and which they are not disclosing or if they are not paying taxes on those income then again it will be difficult. Categorization of goods and services, right? this is a difficulty which we are facing in the product method and to differentiate between the final goods and the intermediate goods is also not an easy task. And lastly because of inadequacy of data, the data is not properly available to us, there is a problem in calculating national income. right? So, these are some problems we have and then uh, this is difference between factor cost and market price like I said, uh, factor cost is the cost which is uh, been taken up for the used uh, which has been calculated for the factors of production, right? the cost which is incurred for producing that good and market price is the price at which you are going to sell your product in the market. Okay, so, this is all for today, these are the topics which we have covered in our today's class, we have talked about circular flow, national income and the methods of measuring national income. So, look at the books we have uh, here for the lecture reference book and this is all for today's lecture, I hope all of you have understood it well, thank you all of you.